Okay, just turn off the sound. There we go. Okay, well, right on time, 4.30. Um, welcome everyone here live on Zoom and over on YouTube. It's a pleasure to have you all join us this afternoon. And thank you so much to our speaker for being here with us today. Um, probably our speaker doesn't need much introduction, so I'm going to keep it very short and give you all the time to talk to us about uh, hedonia. Um, but Martin is uh, interested in understanding hedonia, which is a pleasure, and eudaimonia, the a life well lived, basically, or purpose. Um, and he is, his team use advanced neuroimaging methods, neurosurgical and computational methods to understand how that works in the brain. <laughs> Sound is working. <laughs> Um, and the central premise of that work is um, that in order to treat affective disorders, we need to better understand uh, hedonic processes in the brain. Um, the team is split between uh, Oxford and Aarhus in Denmark. <laughs> um, and it's an absolute pleasure to have you with us today. And I'm happy to give the floor to you already. Take it away. Thank you so much. Okay, well, we, we already had somebody laughing there, so you already know what I'm going to show you. But just to keep the good mood up here, let's hear. Well, maybe not. Here we go. I don't make you laugh now, buddy. <laughs> it goes on and on. So much so I can't stop them. <laughs> Isn't that wonderful? It's so difficult not to laugh with them, right? And it's so difficult not to see them as hugely cute. And yeah, I mean, of course, it's also hard not to think about if they're but they were crying instead, that would be kind of, kind of hard, yes. So today I thought I'd talk to you about all the work that I've been doing over the last 20 years, sort of give you a tour of the kind of things that led me to hedonia, pleasure, and then to eudaimonia, human flourishing. And the place that I'll start is about emotion and how we might get some feeling about that, how we could use that to really reverse engineer the human brain, how pleasure really is important for survival and how it is that life is really cyclical, and that's really how we need to understand that. And they're gonna talk about some of the work that we've done where we've been able to move different brain states between say awake and sleep, but also potentially many other kinds of states. I'm gonna to talk to you about what is really orchestrating the brain and how that works with hedonia and eudaimonia. And then I'm gonna to talk to you about some, some funky stuff that we've been doing with psychedelics. Um, but let's start with emotions. And let's start perhaps with the Nobel Prize winner, John Steinbeck, who wrote a book called Love from the Sea of Cortez, together with a field biologist called Ed Ricketts. And um, they were basically sailing around um, just when the war started. And, and they, they came up with this book and they were talking about many great things. And one of the things they, they sort of thought about was that they said, when well, man might be described fairly adequately, if simply as a two-legged paradox, He's never become accustomed to the tragic miracle of consciousness. Perhaps, has been suggested, his species is not set, has not gelled, but is still in the state of becoming, bound by his physical memories to a past of struggle and survival, and limited in his futures by the uneasiness of thought and consciousness. So what is this tragic miracle consciousness? Why is it that we're constantly pondering about things that happened in the past or things that may never come to pass, and we forget to be in the now? Are we truly tragic? Can we only think about or worry about things? What are the chances of actually enjoying and flourishing while we are here? So in my work, I started working on emotion. And in fact, I've written a, a textbook on this back in 2014, which is really about finding out how it is that emotions are these multifaceted, I think, very large molecules. But really, they consist of smaller, much more manageable, and much more um, easy to study things like pleasure and pain. And so that's really what, what my main focus has been. And 
Emotions, of course, need no introduction. You look at any of these, these images and you can immediately see that they have different kinds of, of emotions on their face. Sometimes it's easy to decode, sometimes it's not. But what is important about emotions is that they have time scales. So when you see people move their faces, smile, laugh, you know that that's something that's happening over seconds, perhaps minutes, if those babies were anything to go by. But at the same time, there's these auto autonomic changes. We start sort of having sweaty palms if we're nervous, or we start having fluttering in our stomach if we're in love. And then we start to be able to self-report of it on, on this over minutes, over hours. And they may develop into moods. They may even develop into emotional disorders. And they may solidify themselves as personality traits and dispositions over a lifetime. But the key thing here is that there's a time scale. There's an order to it. And there's a repetition to it. And so people have been thinking about this for the longest time. Socrates in Plato's retelling talked about the pleasures and pain of the soul. And that's what he really said that emotions were. Aristotle, on the other hand, and you'll see that I'm an Aristotelian in the way I think, he said, emotions are all those things that so change men as to affect their judgments and that are also attended by pain and pleasure. Now, Aristotle was a, a very interesting philosopher, but of course, he really should have said that so change women as to affect their judgment, because of course, there's no real difference here between men and women. We also know, however, that there's a huge burden when things go wrong, when things solidify and become mental disorders. I don't need to show you this, I'm sure you know this, but it's a very large amount of suffering out there. And if we could somehow find out how it is that we could rebalance the brain and make sure that you don't go from acute to chronic problems, we could potentially alleviate a lot of suffering in this world. And so people have been thinking about this for at least for the last 80 years. One of the earliest conceptions of where in the brain we might be able to find emotions was by McLean in his 1954 paper, where he talked about the triune brain, where he had this idea that there was a reptilian brain that then was sort of superseded by eventually the pinnacle of all things, namely the human brain. We, of course, now know that that is not true, but we do know that, um, as already Paul Broca and then Papes said in 1949, was that the structures that are on the midline, that are sort of hidden inside the brain are really the kinds of structures that one could expect and in fact have been shown to be important for emotions. And people like Joe Ledoux has been making a career out of telling us that the amygdala is extremely important for emotions, of which he's probably right. But of course, the way that that has been reported in the popular press is to say that emotions are really the fear center. So amygdala is the fear center. You see a snake and you immediately react to it because your amygdala is your fear center and that's telling you that. We will see that that's not how emotion works. And I don't think Joe would say that that's how they work. In fact, it's probably a much larger circuit. And in that sense, Antonio Damasio was more on the ball when he'd used the, he had the idea of Descartes' error based on this railway worker, Phineas Gage, who was tampering with a, with a tampering iron in order to make controlled explosions. And one day he forgot to put the sand in and that iron rod went straight through his head and landed about 150 meters away and since has been recouped and can be found at Harvard. But remarkably, he survived, although he was changed. How much he was changed, we don't really know because, of course, eh, all we have really is his attending physician saying that he survived and he changed. But that didn't stop Antonio Damasio from starting to think about how it is that emotion and reason are put together and how it is that reason almost certainly is superseded or underpinned by emotion and that the ventral medial prefrontal cortex, the orbital frontal cortex and various structures in the midline are probably key to this. He was not the first to say this. James and Lang had this idea already a century before that. And in fact, we at Waller Norta in his 1971 paper had a very similar idea of what Damasio called the somatic marker hypothesis, um, namely the idea that you have these signals going from your brain to your body and they interact in, in very interesting ways. So this was sort of the state of play back in the early 90s when these machines came online and people started thinking, what if I do these subtraction paradigms? What if I get somebody really happy, put them in a scanner and then I subtract some other baseline state or induce sadness, disgust, fear or anger? And of course, what you get if you use that simple-minded approach of basically subtracting things, you get what we call neophrenology. You get a Christmas tree of, of many different parts. Because is it truly, a, I mean, what is the baseline for happiness? There are some real problems with that kind of way of doing neuroimaging and thinking about how it is. And one of the things I'll talk to you about today is something that won't be surprising to you, namely that it's not about single regions, it's about 
networks. So it's not as if we can say the amygdala is the fear center or you know, the orbital frontal cortex is the anger center. That's completely wrong. The way to think about it is that different parts of the brain are playing different roles depending on what network they are involved in. So the amygdala will play a role when it's involved in fear processing and it will play a different role when it's involved in disgust or when it's involved in reward. So in other words, we have to think about the network and we have to think about the network, not just static, but over time. And we need to find methods that allows us to do that. And not only that, we need to not just be able to do what we've done so far, namely just observe things, we need to be able to build models and take the models apart to truly understand those models. And so we need really to reverse engineer the brain. And in order to do that, we need to think a little bit about what it is that our brains are doing all the time. Here I'm showing you a black and white image. And it's only when I'm showing you this image of my two daughters playing in the sun many years ago that you can't help yourself but see those two girls sitting there, even though you have limited information. I've immediately given you a prior and you are able to do the kind of prediction that means that your, your, your sensory, uh, the way that you have that sensory perception is being guided. And it's true not just for the visual, but also for the auditory. Here's a, a young girl who's got a cochlear implant. And as many of you will know, the cochlear implant is a way of actually making sure that she can listen and hear things. But she hears things that are degraded because you downsample what is actually what you will be hearing right now to a, a much simpler version. So you would hear something like this. <laughs> Sounds like complete gibberish, yes? <laughs> and yet, if I play you the undergraded version, so the non downsample version, the wife helped her husband. And I now play you the degraded version. <laughs> Suddenly, you are able to recoup the signal from the noise because now you have a prior. Your prediction machine that basically is working out, doing, working out what the statistical properties are and trying to find, finding meaning, finding signal in noise. And really the way this is working, and one of the reasons why these, we are like this, and not just us, but all of the all of the beings on this earth, is that we need to survive. And so in order to do that, we have to be survival machines. We have to have hierarchical predictions in order to solve NP-hard problems. What is an NP-hard problem? It's a non-polynomial problem. And most problems out in this world are non-polynomial, meaning that if they are sufficiently complex, they will basically never be able to solve them if you were a computer. So you need heuristics in order to basically cut off some of the branches of the decision trees. And the way you do that is and this is my contention, but I think the evidence is very strong, and I hope to convince you of this, is that you have emotions, in particular, you have reward and pleasure in order to do that. And when those things go wrong, when the network imbalances come about, and there are many ways they can come about because the brain is a very complex machine, then you get the problems of anhedonia, lack of pleasure, apathy, lack of motivation. And those are the things that really go wrong in neuropsychiatry. And if we were to understand the normal system and we understood how it was that they go wrong in different disorders, we could potentially actually do something and not just things that might work, but things that definitely will work. But in order to do that, we need to understand those cycles, the long lasting ones, the one of a lifespan, seasonal, circadian rhythms, but also the short ones, like the ones that you know, made me think that I couldn't get a coffee. So I'm thinking about coffee right now. So I'm in a cycle where I wanted to get this over with so I can get my coffee. And not that I'm addicted or anything, but you know, that's what I want. So how do I do that then? What kind of extra tools do we need in the toolbox to understand that? Well, the first one I would contend is hedonia, which comes from the Greek word hedus, which means the sweet taste of honey. And hedonia is really important for, for our survival. It's what drives us to food, sex and to social other beings eudaimonia on the other hand is slightly more complex it's very difficult to induce eudaimonia in you i mean I, we'll talk about a few ways one could potentially do this in a scanner but really eudaimonia is about flourishing it's about a life well lived it's about being embedded in meaningful value with a sense of engagement and it's very difficult to get into that state. And yet I'll, I'll try to convince you later on that perhaps we can get a glimpse of how the brain is reconfigured when we not only feel pleasure or no pleasure at all, but feel meaning. And I think music and social interactions and potentially psychedelics and meditation, although I haven't written it here, would be ways that we could actually get to, to those kind of states. But in order to do that, we need to think about how it is the brain is structured. So when I was showing you the images earlier of the two little girls 
in the uh, playing in the sun or the viewer hearing, you either got something into your V1, then it goes up the cortical hierarchy into higher visual areas. And eventually we get to more specialized areas, including the, the fusiform face area. And you've got a sort of a, a very kind of distinct way in which you go from, from the outside and you go to the inside. So if I was to take out your visual cortices, you would go blind, but you wouldn't go unconscious. You wouldn't go have other problems. So in other words, there are some parts that are really to do with processing the, 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 the world. And then there are some parts that are about actually doing something about the world. And here in green, I've got the visual and in blue is the auditory. And you can see how they come together in, in hetero, what Mizulam called heteromodal, paralympic and limbic areas. And really, this is the idea of Bernard Bars, the idea that we have a global workspace, that we basically are able to integrate all of that and make that information available on a scale-free manner to the rest of the brain. And so that's really where we're going. We want to understand how it is that all of this is put together so we can orchestrate it. We have the emotions to guide us so that we can understand how it functions in normal people and how it is not working so well in some cases. So this idea then of the global workspace is the idea that we have things coming in, like those visual or auditory things coming in. We have some things from the past, things of having experienced other babies. We have this evaluative system that tells us that babies are really important, not just because they are our own babies, because of course they're not, but babies in general are important so that we can stay on this earth, yes? And then there's something about the way they sound that means that we have to stop everything. We can't go and get that cup of coffee like we wanted to, we really want to hear them. And then we need to do something about the world. And uh, Jean-Pierre Changeu and Stan de Hen has come up with this theory, which I think is a beautiful theory um, and a very, um, very precise theory that has allowed them to study this in very great details and looking at what it is that it takes to come into the global workspace. However, with the kinds of work that they've done, they've never really tried to, or they've tried, but they haven't managed to actually find the nodes that are important for the global workspace. So we'll get back to those. Because, of course, that's very important to find out what are the, the clever elderly women that are sitting in this assembly in this global workspace that basically orchestrate and run everything. Let's see. So, but before we get there, let's just think for a moment about the pleasure cycles. So here I am sitting thinking about coffee. I would quite like to leave this conversation and actually go and get a coffee, preferably a good one which means that I probably would have to go to a barista to have it made. So that probably is not an option, right? But I'm thinking about it all the time. And eventually I get to engage with the good cup of coffee and there will be pleasure there. Usually for food, the best pleasure in the beginning and for other pleasures, as we'll talk about, it's at the end. And then after that, I'm able to do something else. Yes. So what is going on here? Well, we have these prediction and meter stable cycles and set networks that are constantly moving us through these phase transitions on the short term and on the long term, as we'll see in a moment. We need to optimize the resource allocation for survival because we can only do a limited number of things. And the rewards, the babies, the coffee, whatever it is that takes your fancy are the things that basically guide and run your life, as it were. They are motivational magnets. They initiate, they sustain, they allow you to switch states. And my contention here is that the pleasure cycle and the various stages here are essential for making the right kind of necessary decision making. And so think about this for a moment then. Here I am thinking about coffee. I'm thinking about having this past experience. I'm making predictions about how to get that coffee. I'm evaluating the probabilities, but because I've got emotions, because I've got prior information about what is good coffee and also what is sociably acceptable to do in the situation, I can discard some of those outcomes and I remain talking to you. So that, of course, is a way of thinking about how it is a reward in a very real computational kind of way is basically shaping our decisions. And they're shaping our decisions, not just in the moment of now, but also at different times of day. Within, embedded within the circadian rhythm, it feels very different to those kind of cycles. And the cycles could, of course, be about many things. And those kind of cycles also change as we change, as we get older, from our infancy all the way to late adulthood. And there are really three windows where they probably change us more than anything else in the infancy that I've shown you in adolescence and then when we become parents. So those have been some of the things that I've been, I've been quite interested in. And so for those of you who know my work, you'll know that I've scanned a lot of people in a lot of different situations. You will also know that I'm Danish. So this is a Danish slide that has come in. It's not mad, it's food. And so this is an example of somebody having food in a scanner. And you can see how one of the regions that were active was the orbitofrontal cortex. 
these are people playing a social game and you can see that when they are playing this game, they get activity and a network involving both the fusual face area, but also both the cingulate and the orbital frontal cortex. If they take stoffer, which is not stoffer, but it's basically drugs, methamphetamine and naive group Oxford undergraduates, you can see how it is that when they get the first um, joy of methamphetamine, they get the whole network of pleasure lighting up and simulated with the gambling system. So the key though, from all of this, and there are not many places that I haven't had somebody in scanner is that it's one system that subserves all of them. So evolution has built one system, but there may be different routes into that. There may be different things that different motivational magnets that allows us to engage in that. And so in my work, I've worked a lot on the orbital frontal cortex, partly because it was terror incognita when I started many years ago. And I wanted to understand how it is that it basically links all of these aspects as a general hub, not on its own, but in concert with other things. And so I've worked a long time on that. And then the one pleasure that I always wanted to study, but couldn't get the ethical permission for, of course, was sex. Um, you know, we are supposed to close our eyes and think of England here. So it wasn't possible to do it here. So I did what most people would do in that situation. I found myself a Dutch friend. And my Dutch friend is called Yannicko Georgiadis, who is this amazing person who is like Masters and Johnson rolled into one. He is the world's top sex expert. And he has conducted a number of studies, including this one, which is looking at what happens when women are faking orgasms compared to when they actually have orgasms. Um, we can talk about the details later and exactly what needed to actually have orgasm in a scanner and so on. But for a moment, let's not focus on that. But let's just focus on what it is that is changing. As you can see, basically the orbital frontal cortex, there's a massive change as you have that orgasm. And that's really what is driving it. Now, it's not just frivolous because I like to show you what ha happens in the brain for sex, but because sex is really important. Sex is important to have children, but it's also important to have pleasure. And what happens here is that you go from desire to arousal, to plateau, to orgasm, to refraction. And as that is happening, as you can read in our 2012 paper, you can see how it is that there's an orchestration of different regions changing. And one of the key things to remember here is that in all the neuropsychiatric disorders, what is happening is that you basically find it difficult to change between these states. You may be able to desire things, but you can't get aroused, or you are aroused all the time, or you can't get orgasm, or you can't have the refractory period. And it's a huge problem. Most patients that come to their doctor won't say that they have got a sexual problem, but it's almost invariably one of the key problems of the disease. So if we could understand this, which is what we're doing, we could basically try to understand how it is that we can get this orchestration, get this darts going in the right kind of way to make sure that we can make those kind of phase transitions. And so that, of course, is what we'll talk about in a moment. How is it that we change one brain state to another? How can we force them to change if even if there are problems and they don't want to change. But before we get there, let me just sing the praise of a great friend and a great scientist, Kent Barrage, who is one of the top scientists in the world and who has basically mapped the pleasure system, not just the pleasure system, but also the wanting system in the rat. And the way he does it in, in, in rats is that he gives them a little bit of sugar water. And it turns out that rats basically lick their lips in proportions to how sweet it is. So it's a wonderful kind of marker of something which is really nice. And once he's got that, he can then manipulate the, the, the brain. He can take parts out. He can use optogenetics to stimulate it. And he can show that there is this, this one rule, one, this one network that rules them all with some parts like the nucleus accumbent shell is a very important part of the pleasure circuit. The ventral pallidum is another one. It turns out that if you take out the nucleus accumbens, the animals stop making these pleasure reactions for a couple of days, but then they regain it. On the other hand, the evidence is that if you take out the ventral pallidum, they basically no longer are able to feel pleasure. So in other words, we now know that there are these regions that have to communicate in the right kind of way and will change the way to communicate as you go through the cycle. Because of course, here I'm just showing you the, the hotspots, the ones that if you stimulate, you like a dimmer switch, you can turn it up and on. And the the game is on. We want to find out where are those in the human brain. Here is the sort of evidence from the kind of neurophonology that I've shown you earlier. We know that the orbital frontal cortex is important. We know the nucleus accumbens is important. But how do they actually interact? So this, of course, is where we are going and where we are. So in order to do that, 
one has to do a number of things, but I thought I'd just return very quickly to the babies that I showed you earlier. Because of course, babies are vulnerable. And as I said, this is one of the key stages. They come out too early and we need to care for them. Um, and the way we do that, of course, is by interacting with them. And yet, if there's something wrong with the mother or father, and about 10 to 15% of men and women will suffer from postnatal depression. If there's something wrong with the baby, like a tiny cleft lip, the problem is that this diet or triad between the parent or the caregiver and the child is no longer functioning the way, and then you will have a problem much later unless you intervene. And so what is it that is going on? Well, one of the first things I wanted to know was whether Conrad Lorenz was right when he talked about the, the um, what is known as the kinchin schema, the baby schema. So I used this MEG to look at the very fast activity over the brain over milliseconds as we are looking at, at images. And here are just three babies, happy, sad, and neutral, and three adults. And we had a much larger set, and we basically had people sitting in the scanner. Now imagine what happened when I saw these results. I was fully aware that, of course, if the result had worked, we would see activity in the fusiform face area, both to the, to the babies and to the adults. And we, you lo and behold, we did get that. And about 130 milliseconds, 130 to 170. This is the average response. But imagine when I then suddenly discovered that there was this huge response in the medial orbital frontal cortex, only to the babies and not to the adults. That came as a surprise since we've replicated it. And basically this suggests that there's something very special about babies, the way they look that can't stop us from actually doing this. And we did this experiment in people that are not yet parents. So it's present in all of us. So it raised all kinds of questions. Like for instance, what happens if there's something wrong with the cliff lip? Here's a baby with a cliff lip. And what you find is that you get a much diminished response in the orbital frontal cortex. At the same time, we know that doctors, so that is surgeons, and, and nurses still find them extremely cute. So somehow we are able to, as it were, change that bottom-up signal, that very fast signal, and still find them cute. And of course, if we can understand what is going on, we could also provide much better targeted interventions for the parents of cleft lip babies. So that's one of the things we've been working on. But equally, like I showed you with the visual, there's also the auditory. And one of the things we discovered is that in fact, at the same time as you hear a sound of a baby, in this case, a baby crying, but it is equally true for laughing, you basically get activity in the orbital frontal cortex. So again, it suggests that there are these motivational magnets out there and we hear them and we cannot help ourselves, but actually let them intervene into our lives and change the way that we act in the world. And they're just really, really cute. And why are they so cute? So look at these two beautiful young ladies. Notice how there's a little bit food left on the right here. And their father is going to play them a tune. And notice how she's got this competing thing. Should you listen to the music? Should you engage with her sister? Or what about those peas? So let's have a look at that. Hi, girls. It's August 6th. Is that right? Yeah. August 6th, 2012. Daddy's going to play them a little song while they're eating their ready? peas. You guys ready? <laughs> I mean, first of all, they're hugely cute, but notice how there was really a competing thing. The one on the left hasn't got any peas left. Well, she's got one, right? But the other one's still got something. She's still hungry. And so she takes the pea and then the other girl look at her and go, you, daddy's playing him song. We got to, yes, we got to dance. And then she goes back at it, right? So there's something really interesting here. So the music clearly is a very powerful signal for social cohesion and not just the music, but also the way that you can see her parents dancing presumably along strumming along for the father and the mother. We don't know what she's doing, but probably something similar to us. And yet, and her sister, of course, is doing this as well. And yet this food cannot st stop from actually having that because, of course, that is what makes us survive in the long term. But, you know, there's something really interesting about music. And this is what I do when I'm not here in Oxford. We have this wonderful center called Music in the Brains um, at Aarhus in Denmark, which is also at the Royal Academy. And really what we want to understand is what is about 
music which is not just pleasurable but meaningful i mean it's not that meaningful eating peas or drinking coffee it's really meaningful to have conversations with people when you're drinking coffee and yet with music you can have those really powerful moments and so that's what we study and, and for those of you who are interested in, in perhaps joining us please let me know we've grown to probably become the largest center in the world um our our director peter boost is a wonderful jazz, um, jazz bass player um so that's the kind of thing and i think although I won't be talking about it today, I, I, I urge you to look us up and perhaps look at Peter's work as well to see what it is about music that is so highly meaningful. And, but before we get to that though, and before we, we, we move on, let's just think about how it is that we know how, if we weren't using this new phrenology, how is it that we can really know about things? And then knowing for me, of course, is about coffee, as you can see, but it's also about having a friend in Barcelona. This is Gustavo Deco, who is the most remarkable neuroscientist with whom I've had the pleasure and privilege to work for many years. And together, we've really tried to make these whole brain models that allows us to not just do this kind of look at data and do subtractions, but really take this serious and like a physicist, build models that we can then take apart. Because only when you have built a model do you understand anything. And so... What is it that we need to understand? Well, here's a very small being, the larval separate fish. You can see how there's activity in this and this whole brain imaging, which is a fantastic technique. And yet you'll see that there are these sudden kind of large spikes in the data, avalanches, critical things that are going on. And the challenge really is to build models that can capture those kind of phenomena that can suddenly allow things to be available to the whole brain like the kind of scale-free things that are needed for global workspace. And it turns out that the complex network dynamics and the whole kind of research field within physics and mathematics have actually built things that allows us to do that. And so what do we do then? Well, again, because I'm a fan of Aristotle, we, we took Thomas Aquinas, who came up with this wonderful quote, quid quid recipitur and modrum recipientes recipitur, meaning that the content is shaped by the container. And of course, the challenge with the human brain is that we have the connectivity and we have the, 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 the brain, and yet we have many different things going on at all times. How do we do this? How can we give rise to all of this complexity in the resting state networks that you all know and love? What is it that is really going on? And can we build models that can capture that? And the answer, short answer is yes, we can. And we can build them with different levels of precision. So we take the tractography, we take a parcellation, and we then try to and have local local models, and then we try to see whether we can't fit the data. So here's an example. We have three regions. In yellow, we have the medial prefrontal cortex, we have the pecunias, and we have the temporal lobe region. And you can see there's no direct connections between the medial temporal lobe and the, me and the medial prefrontal cortex. So, but yet they still are able to change each other. And so in our models, we take this, the actual skeleton of the connectivity. And then for each of these neural masses of each of these elements in the actual, in the parcellation, we then put a description of a neural mass. And then of course we can add any things like conduction delays and noise and so on. And then you take your favorite model. You take spiking neural norm models, you take dynamic mean film models, you take something like the Hoff bifurcation model. And that turns out at the moment to be the one we like the most, because in fact, they are Stuart Landau oscillators. And it can be shown that the dynamics of a cortical area can, in the most simplest form, be described by this Hoff bifurcation model. And it has a lot of beautiful uh, elements to it. But one of the great things is that you can basically move one parameter, the um, the bifurcation parameter A, and you can move it to the left and then the brain becomes more noisy or that particular node, or you can move it to the right and become more oscillatory. So you have a way of stimulating things and stimulating is exactly what we're interested in. So in another large set of my research has been to work with surgeons and in particular, this amazing man called Thibaut Assis to try to understand what it is that when we stick deep brain electrodes into to people, what it is that we're doing for the longest time, as you can read in this review that I've wrote, People thought that when you were stimulating things, you were either blocking things or stopping things from going somewhere else. But if you look at the biophysics of these electrodes, really what you're doing is that you're changing the white matter tracks. You're changing a much larger network. And so that's really one of the things we've been looking for as well. Here he is talking about his great result to somebody who you might know. Um, and one of the things that he has done and pioneered is that he's worked on 
the opposite of pleasure, or in fact, perhaps not the opposite of pleasure, but something that is strongly related to pleasure, namely pain and chronic pain. And what happens, how we can alleviate the pain that somebody has in their phantom limb. So it's well known that if you have an amputation, for instance, 25% of people with amputations will go on to develop pain in the hand that is no longer there, or foot or whatever part that they have amputated, which is really quite frustrating. It's very difficult to treat. You can't really give people opiates for long periods of time because then they become addicted and it stops working and they just get constipation. But what he has discovered and other people, of course, with him as well, is that if you stimulate very specific parts of the brain, the pericadoctyl gray and the sensory thalamus, you can essentially stop that pain. But you can only stop it at certain frequencies. So on table, when the patient is lying there and is in intractable pain and we drill the hole in, people then turns the thing on, and suddenly that pain goes away when we stimulate the 20 hertz. It's very much dependent on the fiber tracks, as you can imagine, but it's also very much dependent on the actual patients or all of the kind of individual things. So if we do that, the pain suddenly goes away and we then turn it back off and the pain comes back. And you can do that and you can then on table find out exactly what are the parameters to make it go away. As part of this process though, we also try to see whether other parameters work. And because if you do things like Parkinson's, it's high stimulation that works best, high frequency stimulation, so 130 times a second. Now, the funny thing is though, if we stimulate deep in the brain, in the pyrocodoxal gray at 100 hertz, the patient go in even more pain. In other words, we're stimulating in exactly the same spot, but you either go, this is really nice, or there's no more pain, or the pain is unbearable suggesting perhaps that pain and pleasure share the same network and why it is that essentially some people are very interested in the connection between pain and pleasure. Also, if you put people in MEG scanners, while you were making the pain go away, you find that the orbital frontal cortex and the parts of the cingulate are the kinds of regions that immediately are changing. So again, it kind of provides causal evidence for all the work that I showed you earlier about the pleasure system. And then when I showed this to a friend of mine, Annie Catterall, we couldn't help ourselves think about how we could make a sculpture of this. And Annie is a very gifted sculpture. So we made this, this sculpture called Pleasure and Pain, which is really just a simple seeding of the actual the electrode and then working out what is the connectivity from that in that patient's brain. And so as you can see, it turns out that the PAG has projections to many parts of the cortical mantle and subcortical, of course, as well. So what about awakening then? How is it then that we can go from one state to another? How is it that I can potentially go from a maladaptive state to an adaptive state? And could we do this with say electrodes or with TMS or with anything really? And what is it then I'm proposing? I'm saying we have some connectivity, which I'm sort of sketching here. I have some energy landscape of how it is that the brain is doing when it's on a healthy working point. In the disease, there could be problems with the connectivity, but of course, there will almost certainly, and there will be differences in the energy landscape. And the question then becomes, could we look at where we could stimulate in order to move that point to a state where we get what we call homeostatic recovery? So we force a transition from a maladaptive state to, to a, a more less adaptive state. So obviously one could do that, and one could do that in, in, in patients, but of course, the problem is you really want somebody who is in one state and in another state. And probably the most natural of all of the states is this paper that we published with one of my former students, looking at what is it that's happening when we are actually falling asleep. And we use something called a hidden Markov model in order to show that they're not really just four stages. And all of the states, as you can read in the paper, all of the patients were staged directly to say they are now in this state and so on. But our data-driven algorithm found that there were 19 states that the brain was going through. And in fact, if you unravel that, if you look at the departure states and the whole kind of transition module, what you find is that you go from being awake, cycling through these states, and each of these states is basically a brain state. And again, in the paper, you can see what those are. And then you sort of fall into to deeper forms of sleep. And then you may come out of that again, and you may eventually fall all the way down into N3. So there's a choreography, there's a way in which this is changing. Of course, the way it's changing is because the excitatory inhibitory balance in different brain regions are changing over time. Now, we wanted something very simple, though, for our awakening. We wanted to see whether we could take the brain in these patients, in these people, not patients, to basically see whether we could make them go from being fully 
asleep to being awake and back again. So that's basically what we did in this paper from 2019, where we built a model that fitted the, so we built one of those models I've told you before that fitted the empirical data. And then we basically just started to stimulate each node to see whether we could force one state into another. And so here's just some results showing that we could get the awake state and the sleep state. And, you know, the mere model fits fairly well. It's not perfect, as you can see. I mean, this is not exactly like that, and this is not exactly like that, but it's close enough so that we have an idea that these two states are different. And now we can start to basically go through all of the regions and stimulate them one by one. And what we were able to show is that, and again, this is the Hoff model. So all we did was remove the A parameter, either synchronous, so make it more oscillatory, or to uh, make it more noisy, so in other words, making it negative. And you can see it, almost anywhere where you stimulate, apart from the visual cortex, you can basically make this transition from being deep asleep to, fall, to being awake, which of course fits very nicely with what we know, namely that if we hear a baby crying even very softly, we cannot help ourselves but actually wake up. On the other hand, as you can see, it's basically at least a factor 10 out if you want it to go the other way. And notice how if we want to go from awake to asleep, it's much harder. And also we have to noise the system. And if we do the opposite, the system, this transition doesn't work at all. So in other words, these results show that in principle, we can now have a way of building a model of the brain awake, building a model of it asleep, finding out where we need to stimulate in order to force a transition to the other one. So this, I think, is potentially quite exciting. Because, of course, it gives you an in principle way in which we could then start to look at not just what happens when people are asleep, but when people have mood disorders. Could we find out what is the target state? Could we try to find ways, not necessarily by stimulating, but finding other ways that could transition the brain from this maladaptive state to a balanced state? But, of course, it's a brute force approach that I've shown you. It's a, I mean, it's a first try. And so really what we wanted to know was, I mean, again, it doesn't really make a lot of sense to try to stimulate the visual cortex to wake somebody up, as we saw, or stimulate some other part. What we want, of course, is we want the parts of the global workspace. So we needed to find the global workspace. And so in this paper that some of you may have seen, we basically used the data from the HCP, so from the Human Connectome Project, a thousand people that all have been characterized extremely well for the myelination in terms of different regions, and one of the interesting things about the anatomical hierarchy is that you can see here in red, in deep red, you can see you've got the somatomotor areas, you've got the visual cortices, and you've got the auditory cortices. In other words, the outside of that ring that I showed you earlier, while everything above that is fair game and it's most likely to be where it is, but that one would find the intricate part of the, of the networks. And lo and behold, Bert and Al in the Nature Neuroscience have shown that, of course, if you just look at the century, so if you just look at simple correlation between these numbers and the EO networks and the century EO networks, you basically get them much higher correlation. But really what we want to look at are the control networks. We want to find out what are the nodes that are basically orchestrating and running things. And in order to do that, and again, I urge you to look at the paper because I don't really have time to explain the full details. We used a really interesting new technique that we spent about two years to perfect namely what we call normalized directed transfer entropy, which is a form of, um, it's a form of, of, of Granger. But the key thing here is that we did the surrogates the right way. We did a number of technical innovations that allowed us to basically take any region and look at whether it was driving activity or being driven by activity by another one, which is what I show you here. So this is all the brain regions, all the 378 brain regions, Granger plus some cortical, both um, so how they look at each other. And now if you take either the, the row or the column you can and sum them up, you basically get the total amount of things coming into a region or the total amount of information going out from a region. And once you have that information, you can build what we call a functional rich club, which of course is a pun. It means fric, which means money. It's not a rich club. It's a French joke. Yes, not very good, but still, you know, we try and so when you do that, you can build the functional rich club, not just for resting state, but you can do it for any of the seven other tasks that are available in the, in the, um, in the human connectome project. And so we basically look for what is common. So what are the regions that are always available? Because it stands to reason that if you're orchestrating information and you have a visual task, you would ask some experts, some brain regions that are expert in visual things to be joined, but they may not join if it was an auditory task. So we're looking at what is common here. 
And so we were able to identify, as I'll show you in a moment, what are the key regions that are orchestrating things. But not only that, we were also then able to build a model to basically build a computational model. And then we took those regions out. And if we were right, then the whole system would fall apart, yes? And so this is just a simple thing that shows you that the in, so the regions that are, that are um, where incoming information is coming in, it's very different from the sensory things that I showed you before, but the outgoing are really very highly correlated with the, with the, um, with the cortical hierarchy. And it's true not just from a very fine parcellation, but also for a less fine parcellation with only 80 regions. And because of the complexity, everything was computed in that simpler, uh, more coarse thing. And also because we knew that people were going to question us about how it was that the fMRI was going to show us things, we also then took MEG. And again, HEP has a lot of data, not a thousand, but 89 HEP participants. And we were able to, able to get the same results using the same method. And so what was it that we found? Well, here you see the regions, the freak, the functional rich club for each of the tasks and rest. And then the intersection of those are regions that include the nucleus accumbens that we've spoken about before, about the precuneus, which we haven't spoken about before, but a lot of what you will know is on the midline and seems to be, for instance, a very much a very integral part of the default mode network. We got the putamen, we got the posterior cingulate, we got the itmus cingulate, the hippocampus and the amygdala. And if you think about it, it works really well with what Dan Dehen and Jean-Pierre Jean-Chou were saying. We have to have information coming in. You have to worry about the past, which of course is about the hippocampus. You have to worry about the the value, which could be this, which of course we know that the nucleus accumbens and the amygdala plays a role, and you have to have regions that are to do with attentional biasing. So that's kind of exciting, but of course it didn't really tell us, and this is where we're getting into the work that I've been doing over lockdown with Gustavo, namely how is it that that information then is transmitted to the rest of the brain? And it turns out, and it was a kind of a shock to us and nobody else had really looked at that, but it turns out that we were able to demonstrate that what happens in terms of the way that the brain is organized is that it's turbulent. Now, a lot of you will know turbulence from when you've been on planes and suddenly you, everything starts shaking, you think you're gonna die. Hopefully that's not gonna happen. But of course, the key thing about turbulence is that it's a scale-free way of moving. In the case of, if you are in the water, you have all these whirls, this very large world that becomes smaller and smaller and eventually you have energy dissipation. It's a way of transferring energy over scales. Now in the brain, it's a way of transferring information over scale in a scale-free kind of way. And it turns out, as you can see here, this is the, the empirical data and this is the best model fit. And as you can see, what is really cool about this is it basically shows us a way in which we can then compute and work out how it is that you have this information cascade of things moving in time. And it turns out, and this is in work that we are that you can find a bioarchive, but it's currently being reviewed. It turns out that the long range connections that are found in the human brain over and above what you would expect with what is known as the exponential distance rule is basically something that can only happen if you have a turbulent regime. So in other words, you can only move information on a scale free way if the underlying system is turbulent. So that's a lot to take in. Um, and I, you know, I just want to finish up though, because I don't have a great deal of more time if we have to have some questions as well. I want to talk, talk to you about something that certainly feels a lot turbulent, but also feel highly meaningful for people. I want to talk to you about what it is and how it is that one might be able to study eudaimonia. It's not a question of giving people sugar water and looking at how much you're, you're licking your lips, but it's really about finding something that feels meaningful to people. And people will report when they have psychedelics that the report it is as as powerful and as meaningful as when they had the first child, when they first got married, when the most important thing happened in their lives. And it's really in many ways kind of crazy that having a drug, say magic mushrooms, could transport you in that kind of way. And yet this is what people report. And it's also known that it changes people. It's very well known, as you will know from one of my collaborators, Robin Carter Harris, that you can basically now for treatment resistant depression, you can help people if you give them psilocybin with psychological treatment. Another one of my collaborators from John Hopkins, Matt Johnson has shown that if you find it very difficult to quit smoking, you can basically give people a little bit of psilocybin and psychological treatment. And after a year, up to 65% of people that have undergone this treatment are still smoke free, which is unheard of. 
So something happens with those psychedelics that is changing the way that we actually feel. Now, psychedelics are not necessarily pleasurable. In fact, many people, as they go through the trip, for those of you who've seen that, will see that it doesn't feel pleasurable. And yet there's a really interesting link between suffering and flourishing. Often it's when we've gone through great difficulties that we suddenly come to see things for what they are or what we think they are, what they give us meaning. And so, again, we need to understand that. And in order to do that, we need to understand what is it that is binding, what is it that is changing in the brain as you're doing the psychedelics. So here are four of the receptors and a transport G, uh, the HTT of the serotonin one. So you have the 1A, the 1B, the 2A, and the 4. And all of this is the wonderful work of Gide Knudsen from Copenhagen, where they've used PET to basically measure the, the amount of various receptors. And as you can see, because you've just seen the global workspace, you can see how it is that there's very large receptor density of the 2A in the areas that seems to be orchestrating things, while other ones like the 1B doesn't really have the same kind of binding. So already there, you could start to think, well, maybe the 2A is in fact what is creating this. And in fact, it's been shown that all of the psychedelics are really just acting on 2A. And so we couldn't help ourselves but build a model where now, instead of the Hoff model, we used the dynamic mean field model where we could manipulate the excitatory and inhibitory pools of neurons and specifically the gain. And we could change that gain in proportion to the map that we got from each of these receptors. And we were able to do this in the paper from 2018. You will see this. We were able to show that only when you took the gain from the 5-HT2A receptor were you able to predict the LSD trip that people went through not the 1A, not the 1B, not the 4, not the 5-HTT, or not the uniform. So in other words, the way that LSD works is by basically changing the excitatory inhibitory balance of the brain, the gain specifically of the excitatory neurons, in order to then change the way that the whole energy landscape is changing. And so suddenly you are able now to communicate with different things, and you are able to make the kind of transitions that you may not have been able to do because you are in the state they were locked in because you had whatever problem it was, but you pro your brain was locked in a state that it couldn't get out of. So, you know, it's an ongoing thing, but one of the great things about this particular paradigm is that we can then start to think about, not about stimulating things, but about designing drugs that could potentially alleviate changes in that receptor distribution or find out exactly where we need to change if there were say white matter changes. And of course, it's not that simple either. So in a follow-up paper from 2019, we were able to show that it's really the, the very careful kind of orchestration and the dance between the, the neural activity and the neurotransmitters and the, the, the raf, raffinuclei and the way that it then changes the serotonin receptors. And really, by doing this model, and again, you can read about it in the paper, but by doing this, we were able to show that it's the dynamics, it's the cycle of this that gives this particular this particular drug, it's really powerful ways in changing it. Now, this of course hasn't really spoken about what it is that we're doing right now. Why is it that music, for instance, synergizes extremely well with the psychedelics? We have a study going on at the moment where we're looking exactly at that. Why is it that music and psychedelics work so well together? What is it about the way that you then change your prior so that you're now no longer, I mean, you start to see things for where they were without your prior. You start to basically change your prediction and the, the way that that whole system works. What is it about things like ayahuasca? Ayahuasca and the Santo Daime Church, for instance, they use it as the sacrament. Again, we've got a study ongoing with, again, with the Dutch friend that allows us to start to look at those things. And, of course, we have Robin's data from his, his uh, psychedelic treatment and Matt Johnson's data from the addiction that will allow us to look at how is it really that these agents are changing the brain sometimes when they work and sometimes when they don't work so that in future we might be able to help people even better. Okay, that's a lot to take in. I realize we've only got five minutes for questions. Um, before though I do that, I thought I'd just show you some other art uh, collaboration that I did with a friend of mine, the most magnificent musician called Milton Mermakidis. And I showed Milton the work we did on the sleep. And he said, wow, that looks a lot like chord progressions. It looks a lot like the kinds of composing that I do. And I can take this theory of composing. And for those of you who are interested, we can talk about it later. But basically, he, he had set up some rules and let the music basically play the music that is being played when you fall asleep. 
Oh, see if we can actually have that. Press that. Thank you so much for the talk. It was very interesting and there is a lot to cover and I'm sure everyone has questions and comments. Uh, so how, uh, so if you have a question or a comment, please feel free to raise your hand. If you're on the YouTube channel, please feel free to write in the comment section and the question will be uh, sent over to me and I will read your comments aloud. Um, again, I want to thank you so much because uh, it was really interesting and really there was a lot to cover, but I think I actually you went through a lot of the questions that I had, it was ultimately answered at one point in the in the presentation. But one of the questions that I, uh, I guess I have and uh, might be loosely uh, related is that looking at sort of happiness. And so have you found within uh, the work that you've done, is there a difference between maternal happiness, let's say when we look uh, at babies or we look at children, let's say, and material happiness? So in terms of like, I don't know, in terms of the brain and how it's processed or how um, the body reacts. So when we look at pictures of babies and then we you're look at, about I don't the, know, cars. You're talking about, you're talking <laughs> about the, the happiness of us using the credit card. Ching! Exactly. <laughs> Is there a difference actually in terms of uh, brain activation? And the way uh, we I mean, process so it. I think the, the easy answer to that is that whatever it is that you do that gives you pleasure is the same system that is being active. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, now, what happiness is, though, is a different matter. Yes. Uh, again, the way I like to think about it is that I think, you know, there's the pleasure system which has to be active. It's like the machine room. It needs to be there. If you don't have that working, you can never feel any kind of happiness and certainly not flourishing. Mm -hmm. So if we talk about maternal love, I'm not sure what that is yet. I mean, I've spent five years over the last five years, I've been scanning young mothers and young fathers before they decide to have a kid. They then have the kid and then we scan them again and then we scan them one year later just to see how it is that their brain changes specifically to the object of their desires, namely to infants, the way they sound, the way they, the way they look and so on. And of course, although we haven't published on it yet, what you find is that their brains are changing. Now, of course, having a child is not just all happiness and light. There's a lot of suffering in there where you get really worried about what might happen to the child and so on. And yet one of the things that they all report is that it feels extremely meaningful. There's a good reason why they had that child. It may not be all because most of the time, of course, and that's another thing I've studied, they don't get enough sleep. So your question then, I think the answer to your question is yes, it's one system that has to work and it has to work in that kind of cycle. But of course, one of the problems with the kachink is that we get addicted to that, right? Just like we can get addicted to coffee or to drugs or all of these kind of things. And of course, if we are stuck in a cycle, that's really not good. You want to be able to do many things. You want to have a coffee now, then you can be with people and then you can attend to other things, right? So it's not, I think that's simple to say, you know, it's, you know, is it the same thing or is it not the same thing? It's it's something that plays out on a on a on a longer time scale. It uses the same kind of mechanisms, but of course, those mechanisms can go wrong, and sadly, goes wrong quite often. Uh, we have a question in the in the conversation box from Eugene Lee. Um, I don't know if you want like to read it, or I can go ahead and read it. Um, please, please go on. Okay, so it says, um, thank you and sorry for keeping my camera off. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the model of whole brain transition for balancing brain assumes generalization. To some extent, at least, that solid neural pattern net or networks are present commonly among various individuals. I wonder how your model incorporates or controls individual differences. Patients with psychological disorders often have heterogeneous symptoms, etiologies, and ages. I think that's a very interesting and very valid point. 
Now, obviously, at this point in time, our models are no longer uh, not yet able to to deal with that individual difference. Although it's something we're working on, because of course, ultimately, we'd like to make them personalized. Um, the big question here, of course, is do we have enough data that we can fit? And so one of the things we're working on is that these models that we make are actually generative. And you can find a, you can find a, one of our papers on, on physics review letters where we basically have shown that we can take a model fitted to a brain, patient's brain and we can spit out data that this actually looks like that. So that suddenly means that you can start to actually generate models of individuals. And the hope is that with time, as we get further into this and as more people start adopting this. And again, if you're interested in this, we're very happy to share all of the codes. You'll find them in our papers, but we're also happy you know, to answer any questions that you might have about them. Because I think the only way to really progress with this is to actually use these paradigms as an open source resource to actually work with people from other labs in order to try to see whether we can go from groups to persons. Whether we will be able to do that in the long run, I don't know. Many people have tried, many people have failed, but I think there is a good chance that this might be something that could actually provide that. Uh, we have a question from Leah. Please go ahead, Leah. Okay, thank you uh, for the talk. I was thinking, uh, um, how about the peripheral um, nervous system? Because uh, we talk about transitions, networks, uh, so not like uh, if I think about uh, music, uh, uh, pleasure, um, sensations, I feel like all in the body. So how these uh, networks in the brain interact with all the nervous systems, also peripheral system? I was wondering. Yeah, about that. no, it's a great question. You know, this is something that has obsessed people for many years. And of course, Damasio was one of the people that suggested that perhaps this is something that goes on at all times. And in fact, this somatic marker is what then allows you to take decisions. Um, but even before him, people like James Lang, um, so William James and Carl Lang, or Carl Lange as his name was, because he was a Danish physician. They basically hypothesize this, that you have all this information from the body. So when you're running away from a bear, you're running away from the bear because your body is telling you to do it, or you're becoming afraid as you're running away from the bear. So there's clearly a very strong interaction between your body and your brain. One of my, one of my, uh, my, one of my fellow students when I was a young man had learned about this and had known how it is that your body basically can put you in a state of alertness. And, and he had learned that because there was this wonderful experiment where there was a young woman who asked people questions just before they got on the rickety bridge or they asked them questions just after the rickety bridge. And this, of course, was a complete setup, but it turned out that once they'd been on the rickety bridge and they'd had that kind of funny feeling, and they then looked at the data, people always found the woman much more attractive after they'd been on the rickety bridge. In other words, because there was this feedback from the stomach. So my friend thought he might as well, he was, a, he was a, on a conference and he thought there was this young woman that he really liked. So he thought, why don't I take her out on one of these banana boats? So he got her on one of these banana boats where you sort of, you got a motorboat and then you just hold on for dear life, right? He thought, you know, if you could get her really excited, then maybe she would think he was the one, right? So they did this and she got really excited and they came in and he's kind of looked at her expectantly and said, what, what do you think? He said, she said, oh, that was wonderful. Really scary. But did you look at the, the, the guy who wrote the motorboat? He's really attractive, isn't he? <laughs> so, so there's a problem here. And I think it's a general problem because she was getting information from her stomach, but the stomach doesn't really, is not her brain, right? <laughs> she just puts, it interacts and it sets your brain up in a certain way that then allows you to make the decision making. But that doesn't change the basic fact of what you talked about, namely that there is a very close link between the two of them, and we really need to understand that. But of course, what counts against that is what Dimashio also talks about in his book, namely that if you have a problem with people that are tetraplegic, so that you no longer have that, then of course, they see us still seem to have normal emotions. So why is that? And then in his book, he comes up with this idea that he has this, there's this uh, as if loop. So you know, is that really true? So in other words, he says, you know, you can simulate what it would be like to have a body, but if you can simulate what it's like to have a body, why are you doing it in the first place? But I think these are really cool and really interesting questions. Unfortunately, one of the things I always wanted to do, and again, I don't have a Dutch friend for this, is I wanted to do the scanning in the brain and in the stomach at the same time. I wanted to see how it is that these things are interacting over longer timescales, especially if they're doing reward processing. 
Thank you. Really interesting. And Michelle, Michelle had some questions. Go ahead, Mish. Hi. Hi, Martin. How are you doing? Great presentation. I had like a different level of questions. Uh, just a random question. You've been working on this for a long time and I was wondering whether you had any tricks on how would someone could increase efficiency of his pleasure system and decrease pain without using electrodes or mushrooms. <laughs> Your go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, as a hedonist, as a fellow hedonist, I think one of the key things in my book, at least, is that I think it's very important. And usually when we talk about hedonism, it has got a bad name because people are constantly either abusing drugs or doing something that is not helping them enormously well, right? And I think the key here is basically to try to vary one's pleasures, not just to do, say, coffee to the exclusion of all else or cocaine or any of these other drugs of abuse, right? I think the key thing here really is to engage in different things. And I think the other thing that I've learned from this is that probably the most important pleasure, which is not just a pleasure, but also eudaimonia, is to be with other people. So when you have coffee, when you have any of these things, do it with other people, because those are the people really that will make a difference and will really get, get you flourishing. And one of the great problems with, say, something like depression is that we tend to self-isolate in in, 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 in West Africa and Senegal, they have this wonderful expression that is in Wolof, which basically says man is man's medicine. There's something about the social bonds, the way that we are together in a meaningful way that basically creates the boundary conditions that allows flourishing to happen. And so the worst thing we can do is what has happened during this pandemic, and we were talking about it before the talk, how it is that we've all been sort of stuck at home instead of being out, you know, kayaking on the Garonne River, right? Or, you know, doing these things to hopefully with other people, yes? And so I think that's really one of the things I would say. Once we get this freedom back, use that freedom to engage with people in a meaningful way about things that feels, there may be suffering. I mean, you may have to, I mean, kayaking for 40 kilometers that I did once near Bordeaux was really painful, but it really also felt meaningful, yes? That's cool. Um, I had another question, which is more, you know, about inter-individual viability with, with, with really getting interested and in how plasticity can occur in the brain. You know, we often feel like the intensity of the feeling comes with contrast. If you never had a gift for Christmas ever and you get this tiny gift one day, you're going to be way more happy, way happier than, than you know, somebody that has gift every year. Um, and, and so, like, you know, do you think the way we feel, uh, if we were to feel like a lot of frequent pain, we'll have... You know, we'll feel more those pleasurable moments and how will it work in terms of circuitry and plasticity in the brain? So these are really good questions. Um, I think there's, there's an asymmetry there, though. I mean, so unfortunately, we have such a thing as chronic pain, like in the phantom limb that I talk about, but we don't have chronic pleasure. I mean, wouldn't it be great if we had chronic pleasure? Couldn't we go from acute pleasure, which is sitting here talking to you, to a guy constantly feeling pleasure? Maybe these patients don't complain. <laughs> maybe yes in fact that could be true um so there's something really interesting about though then i mean what is it then about these states and what is it about the contrast and i think you're right about the contrast in that you know it, but this is really about expectancy so i think the way to term it in sort of in, in neuroscientific terms is that we have these expectancies and one of the great things about music is that we can constantly play around with those Usually with gifts, we can only have one and then it gets bigger and bigger. But with music, we can play with those all the time. And this, of course, is also why we're interested in the psychedelics and music, because on the psychedelics, a lot of these expectations goes away. You basically stop seeing things in a certain way because you no longer have the expectancies and the priors that make you see them in a certain way. So you are more sort of, as it were, I mean, computationally, you're very different because your landscape, your energy landscape is different, but subjectively, you're also different because suddenly these, this is what, what Hoxley talks about, these scales, the doors of perception, they fall away. You see things for what they are and you can then engage with them, hopefully not necessarily during the actual trip, but hopefully afterwards in a meaningful way. It's like you suddenly re- you've, you've changed the underlying landscape and there's a possibility. And interestingly, if you use it for, say, addiction or use it for depression, is only by then engaging in psychological therapy, doing some work, some real work to actually then change the landscape and change those kind of cycles 
that would otherwise occur and is what is then creating this hedonic treadmill. I think we have questions for, uh, we have time for two or three more questions. Uh, Valentina, please. Oh, th thank you. Uh, very interesting talk. And uh, I have a question on the um, possibility of changing one's own priors, as you mentioned in the last part of the talk. And in particular, where do prior stands in, in the functional hierarchy if they are changeable? Oh, that's a really good question, Valentina. I, <laughs> I, wish, I wish I knew the answer to that one. Um, we've just been writing this review that hopefully will come out in Nature Review Neuroscience on music. And of course, the main kind of underlying idea for our center is that prediction and prediction error and the precision of those prediction weighted errors is what underlies music. And so it's one of the things that we've been struggling with. Where are the priors? How is it that they are malleable and not malleable? And how do they, and one of my fundamental questions that I'm working on at the moment is to think about how they sit together with the global workspace. And what is the time scale of those priors as well? Because one of the interesting things is that I can show you that image of my two daughters playing in the sun. I can show you that black and white and you won't have forgotten. <laughs> you still know what that is. I can't play that trick on you twice, yes? And so what is it about permanency? How is it that they get, they get transferred, right? What is the consolidation effect of those? So I think those are really key questions. And, you know, I think we'll just have to continue to try to find out. Uh, Steffi, please. Yes, hello. Thanks, great talk. Um, I have a couple of questions. So one of the questions that came up for me during your talk was, is there a qualitative difference um, between the modalities? The pleasure that you can feel from a visual input, an auditory input, a sensory input, a really good question. I mean, one of the uh, one of the funny things, of course, is that we we put a lot of primacy on visual appearance. Yes, I mean, you know, we, we like to look at things. Yes, and yet all I have to do is close my eyes, and I can't see you anymore, right? Mm -hmm. On the other hand, I can hear your voice. I'm for the baby, you know. Even when this, the baby is not hearing, I can still hear it. I, I still engage with that. So, in fact, if you want to evoke emotions sounds are much more powerful than visual stimuli. We have learned to basically filter out a lot of things. We can see some terrible things, but all we need to hear is somebody in real pain and we really feel that kind of empathy. We can't help ourselves. But even stronger than that, and this is another thing, and I haven't at all spoken about this work, but as you can imagine, if I'm interested in pleasure, I'm also interested in food and the smell of things, the taste of things. And of course, the other thing that is really, really important, and again, there's far too little work with, but my friend Siri Lechnes has done a lot of work on this, what is it that goes on when we're touching people? I mean, again, those kind of things seems to have an even more direct link and, and sort of become motivational agents that seems to be unstoppable. But specifically, the smell is something that I'm very excited about. And again, this terrible pandemic, a lot of people are suffering because they can no longer smell the world. And if you can't smell the world, if you no longer are able to do that, things are not the same. And yet, interesting. interestingly, by the way, it turns out that a lot of people actually get better when they have first or second vaccination. It's like it kickstarts the system back into to being. And one of the reasons we think that is going on, and again, we have trials going on with this in Denmark as part of the flavor center, is that there seems to be regeneration of the olfactory neurons. And of course, interestingly, the olfactory neurons comes in through the nose. And unlike all the other senses, they don't go through the thalamus. They go straight into the orbital frontal <laughs> cortex, which is why... You know, you're in France and Marcel Proust was always talking about that Madeleine, yes? And I think there's something really interesting about how it is that those smells. And also, I mean, again, we talk about love. There's something really powerful about the smell of somebody else. In many ways, what is it about those smells? And not just for a romantic partner, but for babies. You know, when my kids were little, you know, the fontanelle, mm -hmm. basically when they close, the smell of that when they were smitting, if I could bottle that, I would, I would have that any day of the week. That, I think, would be a great kind of uh, you don't work tool. Great, thank you. Um, another question I had was if there is a standardized way of testing it, or if you just have very creative study designs as you go along. St testing what? Pleasure. Pleasure. Pedemonia, yeah. Um, so, I mean, unfortunately, it's not a bit, it's not like with rats where I can just give them sugar water and that, that basically, you know, we have to listen to what people tell us. And 
most of the time people are not necessarily, they don't necessarily know what they do, but it turns out that we can do these funny things, like we can do these operationalized tasks because we've shown that there's a difference between liking things, so telling some how much you like something and working for that. We did the study where we looked at baby faces and we got men and women to play this game where we basically had people rate baby faces. Now, it turns out that baby faces have different forms, but the big eyes, the big ears and the big front are the most objectively cute ones. And in fact, you can measure the proportions and you can make an algorithm that tells you this is a really cute baby and this is also cute, but not that cute baby. And it turns out that men and women will basically rate the, the cute ones as much more cute than the other ones, but men would rate them both of them much, much lower. And so people had done this before and they said, this means that men don't like babies. But I said, well, hold on a moment. What if we get them to play a game where they see a face on the screen and you see a bar that is slowly decreasing and I now get you to work for either keeping that bar up by pressing the key a lot or making it go away. It turns out that women and men are both sensitive to, they will work more for the babies that are really cute than the other ones. But now there's no difference between men and women. And I think personally, it's because it's not okay. If I tell another man like Michelle, I said, I really like babies. You go, are you, are you some kind of funny kind of guy? Yeah. So I think there's something really interesting going on here. I think there's a big difference between implicit and explicit, and those kind of things that we say that we like things. So the subjective kind of like when Danes say, so Danish people are supposedly the happiest in the world. They say we are the happiest in the world. How do we know, right? I mean, it's just because I know that if I tell one of my fellow countrymen that I'm not happy, they go, what is wrong with you, Morton? You should be happy now, right? So in other words, I think one has to mistrust the kind of subjective answers that you get from people. And I think this is really what has been hampering a lot of work on happiness. It's been hampering a lot of work on pleasure. I think we need to operationalize it. We need to have very specific ways of measuring these things within the population. And we need to make sure that the kind of things that we are subjecting people to, whether it be orgasms and fake orgasms, is something that is truly pleasurable, yes? Thank you. Um, I have a final question that is half serious, if I may. <laughs> Okay. Um, so you talked about fMRI and you called it phrenology. You talked about MEG and you called it an advanced hair dryer. I was wondering what you think about tractography. <laughs> well, there's also MRI, yes. So I think it's a great technique. Uh, we work very closely with Henry Kennedy, who is not living mm -hmm. too far from where you are. And of course, he has some very strong views on what tractography can and cannot tell us. Um, I don't particularly have strong views on that. I think it's a great technique. Like any technique, it has some problems. And I think we just need to be aware of those problems. I mean, they go into our models. So obviously, I, I kind of like them. But I also would like an even better measure. And I'm sure we potentially could use that. But I think at the moment, I mean, again, I think it's important not to take these methods too seriously. They show us some part. But the only way we can really know about this is by linking all of them together and being aware of what the differences are. I agree, multimodal, just a way to go. Thank you. Thank you. I think on that note, I think we're gonna we're gonna close up shop. And I just wanna say thank you so much to Dr. Morton Alcango back for such an interesting talk. And I hope that you know next time we see each other in about a month, we're all feeling really happy and have purpose in our lives. <laughs> maybe <laughs> on uh, maybe outside of lockdown or confinement. Uh, just to let you know for the plug for the next talk, we have Dr. Amy Kusayevsky on June 29th at 4 p.m. Uh, she will be talking about co uh, connectomics in neurological impairment and recovery. So please join us on the 29th of June at 4 p.m. Paris time. I wanna thank you again for joining us and thank you, Dr. Kringlebach for such a great talk. And please uh, feel free to share the video, subscribe to our channel and like us on Facebook. Thank you so much. Thank you, bye. bye.